On this week's episode of Marketing O'Clock. You ought to download your data before July 1st, 2020 GA4. Google says you have a year. Out of sight or on site, out of mind, Microsoft Advertising has a new one-size-fits-all campaign for e-commerce advertisers. Shorts reach gets longer with new video reach additions. All on today's show. Welcome, you are listening to Welcome. Marketing O'Clock. Just stay tuned. Digital marketing news, but let's get specific. Digital ads, SEO, and analytics, social media, and more. Yeah. Pretty much everything that'll make your website perform. With new shows every Friday. Every Friday. We give you the news with sass and puns and definitely high takes. Thank you for tuning in. Hey. Hey. You know what time it is. It is. It's officially marketing o'clock. Settle in, sit back, keep it locked. Hey there, I'm Christine Zernhelm. AKA Shop. I'm Nicole Waddington. And I'm Greg Finn. And it's officially marketing o'clock. Here on May 5th, 2023. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us in May. We are so lucky to be joined by the lovely Nicole Waddington. What's new with you? Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Um, Nothing much is happening in my world, which is why I have currently been obsessed with this new Facebook page that I got into called 716, Are We Dating the Same Guy? And choose between both of you guys, though, because I love you guys individually. Every city has one. (laughs) Every, yes. And it, I don't even know how I found it. It might have come recommended to me on, like, the side for recommended groups, but... I got in, I had to answer a whole bunch of questions, check a bunch of boxes, and they let me in. People post crazy stuff on it. Um, I recommend finding your local Are We Dating the Same Guy page for maximum entertainment. Have you found anything out? Like, You're not allowed to tell. When it's yeah. Trips. when That's one of the boxes I check that I won't tell. Oh, what really? I, yeah, what I see on We don't have to keep secrets. She's just spreading the word. Yeah. We don't have to keep secrets in Trader Joe's meal ideas for busy moms. (laughs) All are welcome. You don't have to be busy or a mom. (gasps) That's exciting, Nicole. Um, Well, if you guys don't know, I am 39 weeks pregnant when you're listening to this. This is probably your last show. I don't know. We'll see. (laughs) It's it's your last show. (laughs) Um, Everyone's sick of watching me waddle around the office. But yeah, I probably won't be here last next week. Um, we've been trying to get our toddler used to the idea of having another person in the house. And we do not know the gender. And we keep asking her, like, do you think the baby's a boy or a girl? And she is very steadfast in the idea that it is a girl. She also thinks there's a baby in her belly and her dad's belly sometimes. She seems very, <laughs> very confident about this girl thing. And we're like okay like if it's a girl what's her name she has different answers every time like her name's gonna be baby dolly i'm like okay great but you know what if it is a boy she's like no girl (laughs) i'm like but if it's a boy like what will the name be she's like no girl (laughs) i'll be like okay but if it's a boy like are you're still gonna love the baby right she's like no girl so Um, i really hope for this baby's sake that it's a girl it's a boy (laughs) <laughs> that's my guess it's a boy i'm worried it won't be how she's gonna take it little maseri that's a little <laughs> oh, oh no what's new with you greg well i talk about it a lot my kids just try to gross me out and they think it's funny because i react like i have visceral reactions to how gross they are sometimes and they've got like a new a <laughs> new height They've ruined the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse song. You know that song where it's like, it's Mickey Mouse? M-I-C-K-E-Y. They've changed the lyrics of this song, not to Mickey Mouse, (laughs) but to Milky Mouse. (laughs) And they go, M-I-L-K-Y, it's Milky Mouse's Clubhouse. (laughs) And it is so disgusting to me. And then they go around, they do the roll call too. And like, Donald, here, Goofy, here. (laughs) milky and they go gulp and i'm like this is the most disgusting thing i've ever heard m-i-l-k-e-y milky mouse gulp i'm picturing like you know when daycare centers illegally have paintings of mickey mouse yes. outside of the building yes. and he looks more like a rat yes yeah. 
Yes. So <laughs> that's Milky Mouse. <laughs> but every time they sing it, I just like viscerally cringe because it's so disgusting. That- Milky Mouse Clubhouse. That's my life. Sounds like a great program. You know, they're promoting America's dairy farmers. Yeah, strong bones. Take that, osteoporosis. <laughs> that's great. Well, before we get to the news here, you guys know we cover some SEO news later in the show, but if you're looking for some evergreen SEO content, we have another great podcast that we think you should check out. Wix's Crystal Carter and Morty Oberstein are sharing SEO knowledge every Wednesday on their podcast, Serps Up. So every week, they tackle a new SEO topic. Um, this week, they're talking about shaping SEO campaigns, but a couple of weeks ago, they were talking about kind of the cross-section of PPC and SEO, and they had a very special guest. Oh, really? Who was that guest? Mr. Gregory Finn. Oh, wow. It was so <laughs> great to be on the Serps Up podcast. Morty and Crystal are exactly as you picture, just phenomenal to talk to on and off the mic. And they have phenomenal shows. I know a new episode came out from Vahan from uh, Search Engine Journal, who's phenomenal, and they did content audits. It's just the go-to SEO show for you. And you always like dust up on the what you need to know with SEO, and they go deep. Like I have a migration, and we're training some people. I've got their migration episode bookmarked. Mm -hmm. They're going to listen to it. I'm using it as training. It is a phenomenal podcast. It's evergreen, and you should go check it out after you're done with this. And really importantly, it's entertaining. That's the best part. This week you were sipping on a margarita. Oh, yeah. I was catching a wave. (laughs) Shooting the heck with Crystal and Morty. It's a really fun show. Like They're sharing great knowledge and really insightful SEO advice, but it's also really fun. Tune into the show on the Wix SEO Learning Hub at wix.com slash SEO slash learn slash podcast. Or if you don't want to write that down or type it in, you can just listen to it wherever you're listening to us as soon as you're done with this show. Um, You can also check out the rest of the Wix SEO Learning Hub. They have awesome resources on there. So check it out at wix.com slash SEO slash learn. Nicole, do you have news for us? I do. So... Nicole Farley over on Search Engine Land reported on this, but Google has announced that users will have access to their UA or GA3 data until July 2024. So reminder, if you haven't heard, if you're living under a rock, um, data collection on UA will end July 1st, 2023. And Google will create GA4 accounts if you have not already created yours. But after the sunset, users will have access to the data for another year. And you can export the data, but new data will not be processed. It's also worth mentioning that bidding audience and conversion data will not be sent to Google Ads or third-party integrations from UA, but your data will still be accessible and you can download that. It's coming up, people. It's awesome. If you don't have a plan in place, at least you have another full year to get your act together and get that data out of there. Mm -hmm. Love it. Next up here, we have some advertising news. Microsoft Advertising announced a new campaign type called PLA Extension, and they start the blog post article off by saying, as retail media continues to evolve, the decision brands need to make about where and how to allocate budgets can feel increasingly complex. I just love when an article starts by like acting like we're stupid (laughs) (laughs) and we can't figure things out for ourselves or we're lazy. Um, I get it. They're trying to make it seem like it's making our lives easier, but I'm just, I always roll my eyes and it's a red flag to me. Okay, let's get into the news. So they're calling this a fully integrated retail media solution and it allows you to serve product ads both on-site, so on retailers' websites, and off-site. So it says, quote, you will also be able to activate the retailer's first-party data as well as Microsoft's audience intelligence to strategically target highly relevant shoppers via your access to more ad supply through off-site channels, including new buyers. So they say if you have an on-site campaign that is underspending, quote, it will automatically extend your product listing ads to offsite product placements like the Microsoft Search Network and the Microsoft Audience Network. And that can include remarketing with their first party data, or it could be people prospecting people who are totally unfamiliar w- with your brand. But it seems like another like one size fits all, give us your budget and we're going to serve your ads wherever we want to. And hopefully you get some sales out of it 
type of solution. So this is available to people who want to give it a test. It's called PLA extension campaigns. Greg, what else is happening? Last week we reported that YouTube's ad revenue declined yet again, the third quarter in a row. It was 2.6% down year over year in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, if you recall, fourth quarter 2022 was down 7.8% and Q3 was down 1.9%. So YouTube has some new ways to advertise. So the big news here, I'm just going to read this from their press release. Short form video is booming. It's a rich canvas for every type of content people care about. Music, gaming, sports, lifestyle, learning, food. People love it so much that according to Talk Shop, viewers now report watching more short form video than studio produced TV and films. I would argue that that is all TikTok. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not YouTube shorts. Yeah. You're looking at this thing that they're trying, they're doing, their revenue is down and down and down. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go and check the, like, just vibe check on shorts and see how it looks. <laughs> the fourth short that I saw was a repurposed TikTok with a completely different username than what shows up on Google. And it's just got the, you know, Google um, new at symbol on top of the TikTok. It's like regurgitated TikTok. That's probably mm -hmm. all it is. It's the same yeah. as Reels. And so I figured, I know why people are using shorts now. I, Matt here, um, who owns the company with, with me at Cypress North, um, was talking about the fact that shorts is a way that kids can get around not being able to use TikTok. Because a lot of kids mm. don't have access to TikTok. They don't have their own Instagram account. So they can go to shorts because you can still get through because it's YouTube. And you can see short videos that they're not supposed to see from other platforms. So their parents just have a bad taste in their mouth about TikTok and don't want it on their phones. But YouTube is fine. It's, it's well, like YouTube is, has been more universally like hmm. used. So that's my working theory of who's using shorts. Because I went to the tab and there's there's no synergy between one short and the next are mm -hmm. your dude perfects on there are they making so shorts they make a short and whenever my kids see it they get super disappointed because it's like a crappy version of a video yeah. that they want to watch it's like somebody playing tic-tac-toe with a ping pong ball or something it's not like a well-produced video that they can sit down and watch that somebody tries at it's like a crappy little one minute video that and we watch it on tv they don't have phones or anything I saw them on the draft. A short? No, Dude Perfect. Oh, Dude Perfect. Yeah, they're, that's my life. Just, my kids <laughs> just emulate them nonstop. <clears throat> so anyway, there's some new ways that you can advertise, especially with shorts. So shorts now have video reach campaign capability. So that's when you can use Google's AI to get the best combo of ads and get your reach and efficiency up on YouTube. Also, they're adding in-feed video ads to video reach campaigns to bring more opportunities to connect with your audience across YouTube. And you, all you need to do is upload a 60 second or shorter vertical video along with other assets. And if you have only a horizontal video, there's a tool that will um, AI it into vertical video, I'm sure a crappy version of it. You can also now appear next to trending shorts content. That's what I, I wanted to see what was trending over on, on the shorts channel there. It's called YouTube Select. Uh, you now can show up on the most popular shorts and you could have do this now with YouTube and now is eligible for shorts. So good luck on that. And then there's also first position on shorts. And this is piloting across YouTube Select where you can try to break through at the start of a viewing session. So a viewer opens YouTube Shorts and starts watching and the ad is the first one you see. The opening sentence where they're like, people use short videos more than they watch TV or, or film. Not YouTube Shorts. Not YouTube mm -hmm. Shorts. And you've got a tool it breaks past TV. It breaks through film. It's user-generated content. People putting their stuff out there for free. Like nobody else has this. You are shunning this. It's absolutely criminal to me. Neil Mohan should go to jail. <laughs> like, how are you not caring about your core product and this thing that is the all potential to be TV and you don't care about it? I don't understand. 
Now it's time for this week's Take of the Week. This is a hashtag fire digital marketing take with extra spice served up for you. We simply deliver the take for your consumption. We give no opinions. We don't influence. You make the call. This week's Take of the Week comes from the one and only Julie Buccini. Salt J herself. There was a very vigorous conversation on PPC chat talking about basically letting go on keywords as fixed identities. And Nava Hopkins, Julie, and Ginny Marvin were on it. And Julie had said, basically, it feels like an institutional loss and clients are not interested in paying the machines to relearn stuff they already figured out and paid for. It's definitely an education and contextualization process. Gil Gildner hopped in and said, He's straddling the fence on this one. On one hand, I understand evolution. On the other, many stakeholders are not techie. They're used to cheap CPCs and think that 100% of everything can be attributed. To which Julie then says, I know things are changing and we all have to evolve on how we do things and how we talk about them. But the answer is kind of, quote, well, Google just doesn't want you to be able to do it that way anymore, end quote, is not a satisfying answer for many. Ginny hopped in and said, also agree, Google doesn't want you to be able to do it that way anymore shouldn't be a satisfying answer because that's missing the macro view of what's driving these changes. It doesn't mean change management conversations are easy, but they're necessary. Then there was some back and forth and Julie said, better wording is Google doesn't let you do it that way anymore rather than doesn't want you to. Speed of the chat and all. But it's also not my job to carry Google's water. It's my job to help clients best navigate ad platforms to get the results that they want. A little salt, Jay, for you. I think two weeks in a row for her. Two weeks in a row, back to back, Julie. Love it. Keep the energy up, Julie. Now it's time for this week's I See Why Am I. I See Why Am I, people. This is something you just might not have seen. Maybe something that you overlooked, but you shouldn't have. I see why am I people Meta changed their location targeting options and didn't bother to tell anyone. <laughs> That's it's nice. Very important. I see why am I for us here. So they used to have four location targeting options, and they were people living in or recently in this location, people living in this location, people recently in this location, and people traveling in this location. And some people are just logging into their accounts and they don't see those options anymore. Instead, they see a notification that says, all location targeting will now reach people living in or recently in the locations you select. The other options have been removed, so you won't have to select a type of location targeting here. You won't have to. This makes me, they're just like, why are you ruining your ad platform? Like, I don't understand. And you don't tell people, it's like, you should make that very clear. It could be very important if you're, Jess always brings up, we used to have a client that was a tourism company and we would use these very, very strategically, sometimes to target people who were traveling somewhere. And we would like want to pay a lot of money because they were there right then and it's Facebook and we had interest targeting and like it could work really well four years ago. And now it's just a complete joke. Maybe tell people next time. Now it's time for this week's pew, pew, lightning round. At this point in the show, we split up our content into three parts, paid, organic, and social. First up in the paid universe, we have a little bit of a PMAX roundup here. First, Mike Ryan tweeted from his at Mike Ryan retail account. He said, after months of stagnation, April saw a jump in PMAX adoption. So he has a chart that's measuring cost by cost share. And he says, in fact, it's the biggest automation gain we've ever seen. Likely the windfall of PMAX's warmly received feature roadmap. Note to Google, listening to customers worked. And he has a little winky smiley face. And let's take a look at what some of those features are because people noticed some really exciting new additions to their PMAX campaigns in their accounts this week. So first, Manahamani from his at Manahamani Twitter account said performance max asset group reporting is rolling out. We're seeing this in some of our accounts, super excited about this. And then he has a screenshot to show that it is indeed, there's now this asset group tab there with options for what you can add to your columns. That is awesome. We heard this announced a little bit ago and now it's rolling out. Next, Alfred Simon from his at Alfred Simon Twitter account said placements 
devices and other extra information are starting to show up for Pmax campaigns, not in every account. I don't have it in mine. These insights were always there if you use segments and the reports menu, but now it's much easier to find them. So there's tabs for where ads showed, when ads showed, devices and match locations, which I kind of hate what they're called. Like just call it placements, ad schedule. Again, they just like think we're dumb. I don't know. Um, I guess if it's really only what we were getting in the segments, that's kind of a bummer. I was thinking at first that this was like more granular placement placement information, but maybe that's coming. We love to see more data, so it seems like it's a good thing. Next up, Pinterest announced that they are teaming up with Amazon ads for a multi-year strategic ad partnership to, quote, bring more brands and relevant products to its platform. So people will be able to click on these ads from Pinterest and take in right to Amazon. So that seems like a cool partnership. Google Ads is also planning to change its approach to app bidding. Just thought I'd step up without Jess here. Jess over there? Who is that? (laughs) With plans to adopt real-time bidding auctions for apps. So this should enable advertisers to find optimally priced app inventory more efficiently and boost competition within the real-time app auction. More new features here. Snapchat announced that they are bringing ads to Spotlight, which is basically their version of shorts, which is basically YouTube's version of TikTok. (laughs) (laughs) But they're putting ads in there now too. It says spotlight spots are already available for all advertisers globally, and initially those will be placed automatically. Love that. Google Ads is updating their dangerous products or services policy. This is a quote. It says, in July 2023, Google Ads will update its dangerous products and services policy to encompass advertisements for items that pose an imminent proven an unresolved risk of death or severe bodily harm, particularly if they have been subject to consumer advisories or product recalls. Enforcement of this policy update will commence on July 3rd. Why didn't we have this before? (laughs) I don't know. Like what? But don't worry, people have some time to adjust to this. You'll get a seven days notice before your account is suspended for advertising something that could kill someone. Imminent, proven, and unresolved (laughs) risk of death. Why did it take so long? Get your death ads before uh, July 3rd. Get them, get them rolling now. But back in 2020, I don't even, I can't, I won't even say the words on the podcast because the YouTube it. video will be shut down. Yes. But you couldn't put anything up or your account was suspended. You got seven days if you're advertising a death device. <laughs> like what? Chris Ridley tweeted from his at C underscore J underscore Ridley Twitter account. TikTok is getting a new ad group quota. So... On the 23rd of May, TikTok ads will gradually introduce an ad group quota, limiting how many active ad groups you can have in a single ad account. Your quota size is going to be determined on the account's highest spending month in the past 12 months. And there will be three ad group volume tiers. You'll be placed in one of those. If you're over your quota, you will need to pause or delete existing ad groups or wait for them to complete their ad schedule. And you'll have a notification in there if you need to do that. And that concludes the paid news. And this week's organic lightning round is brought to you by Wix. And Greg, you were just telling me how you were recommending Wix to a client, right? Yes. And I've got my phone up here. A former client had said, hey, I'm trying to start my own company. How much would it cost to build a website? I said, your best bet to get started using Wix.com. And I, this was like instant. And it's not because they're a sponsor. It's because it's the best. And it's because they are putting so many resources to help you. They are far and ahead the number one website tool that cares about SEO. And that means they care about you. And if you care about your website, you should be using Wix. They've got the amazing learning center that not only has podcast episodes that might feature yours truly, but they also have a lot of different webinars. There's one with Ross Hudgens and Mike King in there. And they also have great articles that help you do and perform SEO and how you can implement Wix's tools as well. They care about SEO. And so you should care about them. If you need a website, it's Wix.com, Wix.com, Wix.com. And it's super easy to get started. They have templates to choose from based on your industry. And it's free to set up an account 
and they don't make you give a credit card. Everyone says it's free, but then they're like, what's your credit card number? And we're going to charge it in a week. They're not asking for a credit card. So it truly is free. But don't just take our word for it. Start building beautiful websites that Rain can convert today by setting up a free Wix account. Visit Wix.com today to get started. That is Wix.com, websites without limits. All right. And fresh off the presses, right from when we started the show today, Google is rolling out pass keys, the easiest and most secure way to sign into apps and websites in a major step towards passwordless future. I'm all for that. I'm so bad at passwords. They have really funny commercials on TV for this too. Have you seen? No. It's just like me. It's as if it's recording the person from the phone trying to put their password in the whole time. And it's like, me dying inside because <laughs> I forgot my password. It's really good. Well, you are you might love this change because pass keys will allow you to sign into those apps and websites, and they're more secure than passwords, according to Google. You won't need to remember the name of your pets, birthdays, one, two, three, whatever. Um, instead, you sign into apps the way that you unlock your device. So whether it's face recognition, finger recognition, screen lock, pin, um, and apparently they're resistant to online attacks, so more secure because you ha- it's device-based and human-based. So uh, you can, as of uh, Wednesday when we recorded, uh, pass keys for Google accounts are available. If you're interested, you can check it out at g.co forward slash pass keys for more information. Next up from MarTech, there is more pressure on B2B marketers to prove ROI according to a new report. of people are feeling more pressure on ROI, 27% say it's getting overwhelming, and 14% say that it makes them want to pull their hair out. So pretty aggressive, um, aggressive, I guess. Got a lot of bald marketers. (laughs) Yeah. And one other thing from this report that I thought was interesting was they said automation house, but it's only as good as the data it gets in pursuit of quality. Companies are using an average of 18 different data sources. That's a lot of data sources. All right, and from Marketing Dive, we've talked about this in the past, but Klarna is really making a push to take some of that retail commerce market. And the app has undergone a major redesign that has personalized shopping feed powered by AI, a personal shopper service called Ask Klarna. I don't like the name Klarna. I think it's nice. Do you? It reminds me of Richard Karn for some reason. I think it sounds like Irish. Do you know who Richard Karn is? Of course not. He's one of the finest actors of our generation. He was Al Borland in uh, Tool Time or whatever that show is. That means nothing to me. (laughs) Okay. And this also has a self-service advertising platform for retailers. So you might want to check that out if you're selling products and if you're on Klarna at, at the time. And they're going to be available in select regions. I know this guy. Right? El Borland. Yeah. He seems like a nice guy. All right. From Search Engine Land and Barry Schwartz, the Google Page Experience was never a ranking system, but it is considered a ranking signal. Danny Sullivan had made a, a statement about that, emphasizing that it is not a system because it was removed as a ranking system in the documentation. Why would you think that it's a ranking system? Because you have it listed as a ranking system. It's now not there anymore. But basically, Google removed page experience system, the mobile friendly system, the page speed system, and the secure site systems from its ranking systems page. SEOs are all up in arms. But Barry is not the hero we deserve, but the hero we need. Because he ends the article on Search Engine Land and just says, do not obsess about making sure you score 100s across all core web vital metrics. Core Web Vitals is not that big of a ranking signal. You know better if your site is providing good page experience than a third-party tool from Google. Snaps for Barry on that. He has a way with words. In a surprising YouTube partner program policy change, the time gap before a suspended user can rejoin the monetization program has tripled from 30 days to 90 days. So if you're one of those people selling... Uh, those death products or whatever you're talking about and you're banned. <laughs> you can't get over it. <laughs> if you have a second offense, you're going to have to wait 90 days to be able to monetize. Uh, this will start in June 5th. So if you're one of those naughty folks out there getting banned, just 
clean it up, put some bleeps in there like Tables does for us. All right, the top tech giant from South Korea, Samsung, has been forced to resort to a ban on its employees against the use of the most popular AI-based tools and technology like ChatGPT, Bard from Google, and even Microsoft's Bing. There is some shocking news that uh, one of the company's biggest division um, on Monday had some of their data being pulled in to AI and potentially out for machine consumption. So uh, knowing that the data is stored on external servers and it might end up getting exposed to other people, there is now a ban on AI over at Samsung. And you might want to consider that too. I feel like really the only person that ever talks about like being careful with their data is Julie Bicini when she's always like, don't just give every ad platform all your customers' information, who's liable for all this. We're starting to see some of these issues come to fruition. For a long time, if you had syndicated content, means you had content and somebody else is putting it on their website, the acceptable practice was to, to canonicalize the content to the original source so that your website could still feature that content and then it would be canonicalized to the canon version of the article. Google is now telling publishers to no index content if it's syndicated content. And Barry Adams at B Adams on Twitter says, a pure admission of defeat. Google can't figure out duplicate content and reward original publishers, so they want us to do the work. Most syndication publishers won't know index. Canonicalization was hard enough. So just another stupid step. How can you not figure out what the original source is? And where they're saying that in like a help document? Yeah, so it's um, on the developers.google.com. Basically, they said you... Don't use cross-site canonicals for syndication. No index it instead okay. is the Wasn't kind of sure if it was like the Star Trek account or... How... No, it okay. was uh, developers.google.com. Okay. And Lily Ray chimed in and said, this is like saying, we know you find one million in cash on the street every day, but we'd appreciate it if you <laughs> just pretended it wasn't there. All right, from the YouTube creators account, podcasting content what's that, is available in the YouTube Music app now. It's going to be in the main app, and you can use YouTube Music to download podcasts uh, and listen to them later, and there will be that podcast section in YouTube Music now. And there are many listeners that use YouTube Music, much to... Uh, Your surprise? My surprise, yeah. <laughs> Um, additionally, tables, this is some news for you. Video processing ETAs are now going to be shown, so you'll be able to see when that processing will occur before you could just see some of the like standard def HD. You can now see when the processing will be uh, finished. And then there's now going to be parity on those channel trailers on YouTube. So if you've got a channel trailer, we've got one. You can go check it out, Marketing Clock on YouTube. On desktop, when you arrive on that section, you see the channel start to play. It hasn't been the case on mobile. It is now coming to mobile. So there's that parody there. You will see the channel trailer on both devices. It's time for Barry's Charts with Greg. And this is just maybe my favorite chart ever. It warms <laughs> my little heart. Barry Schwartz put out a post on Search Engine Roundtable and said, SEOs are worried about job security with new generative AI and AI search. And the original chart was blue when it said worried, 43%. Not worried, 57%. So most SEOs are not worried about their careers. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. He then retweeted again and said, chart was mixed up, frowny face. <laughs> <laughs> Did he just try to play a trick on us? So then he took... And this is what really got me, right? This is why I love this chart so much. <laughs> because he changed the colors, and it's now not worried is green and it's smaller. Worried is now blue, but he changed the location of them. He, like, he actually made an all-new chart where it's like flipped. It's not the same looking chart. I it's feel like flipped. the line is not right in the middle of the pie. It's not. And the line goes to the right on one chart on the front. And it's like goes a mirror image. Yeah. He yeah. It. And, he inverted and so, it. Mm -hmm. So actually 57% of SEOs are worried about their careers. Oh, According man. to the new chart. Mm -hmm. 
But I just love that the, the chart isn't made. the same. It's not the same chart if you look t- close enough, right? Mm-hmm. It's a completely different chart. This is chart of the year material. It's got to be chart. This <laughs> is, you know, we don't get a lot of pie charts. No, mm. this is a real delight. <laughs> this is, I, is, I'm telling you, I live for these moments <laughs> in my life. Top 10 moments. That's an organic. What's happening in social, Nicole? All right. First up in social, Elon Musk tweeted that they are rolling out, allowing media publishers to charge users on a per article basis with one click next month. So this will enable users who don't want to sign up for a monthly subscription to pay a higher per article price for when they just want to read an occasional article. And he said should be a major win-win for both media orgs and the public. I kind of like that. I do too. If you could spend 99 cents, I'll check this out. Yeah. Sure. It's kind of like bringing back like Apple Music paying like 99 cents for a song. Yeah, I don't want subscriptions. Like I don't need subscriptions. Like let me just buy 15 articles a month that I want. Also on Twitter, Twitter Daily News at (laughs) Titter Daily said that there's a new subscriber tab on all Twitter profiles where you can now go to see all the exclusive tweets from your profiles that you subscribe to. So that should be already rolled out in the platform. Check it out. One other awesome thing is anybody can offer subscriptions. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. Like Very I democratized, hate, yeah. I, know, I hate it how like YouTube, to get monetization, you have to get to mm-hmm. a thousand or this or that. Like It's just like, it's like Oprah. Everybody gets a subscription. <laughs> And from our favorite Adam Moseri at Moseri on Twitter, he said that there is a new feature that will allow you to bring content to life by adding a soundtrack to your photo post on feed. We're testing this feature with carousel posts now, but more to come soon. And he's wearing a lovely New York t-shirt and not sitting in his normal background with the fancy chair how are we going to talk about what he's wearing in this announcement and not what he wore to the met gala i didn't see his met gala outfit was i didn't even know he was invited adam moseri went to the met gala with his wife monica (laughs) and they looked really good looked good yeah he looked like he was a pajama pilgrim he was in theme i was like you would think he, you know, he kind of has no business being there. You would think he would be like understated, like just try to fly under the radar. No, he came to play. He looked good. I couldn't believe he wore the same thing Little Nas X did. <laughs> oh, thank God he didn't. No, he had like a, he's got like a, like a, like, like a Quaker looking shirt, like was like a Quaker would wear in the 1600s and it was all silk. I was really impressed that he tried. Oh my gosh, upon Googling it, did he go last year too? He must have. Yeah, all of these are saying it's what? from 2022. What the heck? Like, no, I, I had saw this no year's. idea. Oh, this year he's goth. Yeah. No, he's, black. he's a little pilgrim. He's, he's literally a celebrity. He's very Jess Bud. He goes to the Met Gala. He's like the roach on the red carpet. Did you see the roach? Oh, yeah, I saw, I saw, the I saw the one of the most important guests. I learned all about this Met Gala. There's and cats. <laughs> there were cats this year. Short, a lot of shorts. He was sharing a lot of inside tips. Not like, YouTube. He gave this like real man's coverage of the Met Gala in his Instagram post about oh, how the night goes because people really have no idea. We're like that roach just trying to sneak our way in. But he gave a lot of inside tips about like how long the performance is. I was just so delighted to see him there. <laughs> Couldn't pay me to go to the gala. What on earth are we doing with this announcement? We can now put, bring your content to life by adding a soundtrack to your photo post. What the fuck are we doing? What is the need to make music in a picture? What was am, am, I, am, I, am, I, am I that old? Can you be honest with me, Shep? Maybe this was Cardi B's idea. Oh, yeah. I can I'm that. anti-Cardi B then, if this is her idea. Why would you want image, music on an image? I could see how people like could use it in like an ironic way. But, or they like a meme, the, the a meme no account. The no, no, no song. <laughs> What's that? Oh, oh no. no the... Oh no. That one? Yeah. <laughs> or it's like a slideshow. <laughs> Moving on. From TechCrunch, Reddit is testing Discord-like chat channels, giving more avenues for members to interact with each other aside from the asynchronous commenting on threads. So they'll first be testing this with 25 volunteer subreddits, that all have less than 100K members, but they haven't shared a list of those subreddits yet. And they also plan on giving more control to moderators, adding a dedicated channel for moderators to chat about managing the subreddits, 
and giving them power to decide if they even want to change or enable the chat room feature in the first place. I've got a good idea to even spice this up a little bit. Oh, yeah. no. Put a Ready? music track in this Discord. <laughs> you log into Discord and you get music. Oh, like elevator music. Yeah. Yeah, or you could set like a song of the week. Yeah, and when you log it, in, you'll hear the song. You're making fun of Adam Masseri. Yeah, I sure am. <laughs> Eric Sufer on Twitter, at Eric underscore Sufer, had a Twitter thread covering what he has termed a content fortress. And he gives this example of how Meta announced last September it will be removing the shopping page from Instagram and transitioning retailers to an in-app checkout and empowering the flow of data through a content fortress strategy thus retaining all the conversion data in a first-party setting or a content fortress, as Eric has coined. When Meta processes transactions, it retains first-party privileges for that conversion data, which then can be used for behavioral ad targeting. He adds that this use of first-party data for ad personalization absent an explicit opt-in faces an uncertain future in Europe. I thought this was an interesting article. Yeah, I like the use of the word fortress (laughs) and the image he has in the article. At Matt Navarra on Twitter said that Meta has rolled out new discovery and personalization controls for Facebook Reels. So the first being a new show more or show less control to customize the sorts of Reels that you get shown in your feed. The second being a new context label to show why you're seeing a specific Reel, for example, because a friend liked it. And then the third, Reels added to main navigation at the top of the Facebook Watch for quick access to short-form video. I thought Facebook Watch was going away. That's what I was just going to say. Not to hijack the social news again. It's going away. <laughs> they got rid of the... Jada Pinkett is out of the job. I know. They're getting rid of their content. Remember, two and a half years ago, they launched IGTV and Facebook Watch and then immediately abandoned it. They really sure. tried with Facebook Watch. Like they had a show with Jessica Biel. Well, it was oh, so poorly one. executed. They were really trying to do something. Well, it just makes no sense. I mean, just, it does make, they're trying to go after what YouTube has and what YouTube had and then YouTube f***ed out, essentially. Well, they didn't do a great job. No, they sure didn't. And now they took a great thing, the Red Table Talk. Those ladies are going to have to talk somewhere else. Entanglement. <laughs> WordPress is cutting ties with Twitter due to high API pricing. In place of free APIs, Twitter has set subscription tiers starting at 42,000. However, Twitter dev at Twitter dev reiterated that verified government or publicly owned services who tweet weather alerts, transport updates, and emergency notifications may still use the API for free. That's cool, at least. Yeah. Get your get your blizzard warnings. I love that it's $42,000 a month. That you think. Yeah. It's like, bro, we're not all billionaires, you know? So if you weren't, if you just started tweeting about the weather, like mixed in with your other content, then could you use the government? It, the key is verified government account. Oh, well, yeah. Thought I was being smart. <laughs> From the information, there was an article that had scoop that TikTok is working on a new feature for creators to disclose they're using generative AI in videos, similar in concept to disclosing sponsored posts as deep fakes rise. I'm against this. I personally, Tables, you might be on the same same page as me. I love those deep fake sports videos. (laughs) I don't want to know it's a deep fake. Where I think it was Mike, Michael Vick took a ball and like just threw it out of the stadium. And then there's another one. I think it was like Evan Longoria. He's yep. being interviewed and just goes and like grabs the ball. I love those sports deep fakes. Yeah, they're amazing. I don't want to know they're fake. Like they're just awesome. Yes, we need a disclaimer for like fun sports deep fakes. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't tell me. I just want to like go back through the footage a little bit. Tom Brady <laughs> always sure. does it. I love those. Yeah. All right, and Chris Holt on Engadget.com reported that Twitter is set to add a page to its app that tells users who had received a complimentary blue check mark how to cancel their Twitter blue subscription by contacting oh support. <laughs> so, but people are going to. Yeah, well, for background, Twitter removed check marks from all accounts that were verified through the previous system. Um, and required you to be subscribed to Twitter Blue, but then 
Elon Musk added some blue check marks back to certain accounts, namely big celebrities, big following. It seemed like anybody over a million followers yeah. got, got to retain their check mark. Right. But some users suggested that in doing so, Twitter and Musk may have violated the Lanham Act, which is a federal law, U.S. law, that prohibits false endorsement. So they were arguing that having the check mark on their account without paying, you may be appearing to endorse. This Twitter. is just the silliest saga. Fine. They should be able to give that check mark to someone else who wants it. We've, we've got bigger <laughs> problems, but I'm happy that other people are happy with this news. Yeah. I just wonder, like, when you click the contact support, how helpful it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, like there. If you email press, you get there is nobody responding to this in a poop emoji. Like, what are you gonna get when you respond to somebody else? And from Sam Gattel on Tube Filter, Meta is sunsetting Facebook Watch. We just mentioned this in an earlier news section, which was a hub for scripted and unscripted shows such as Red Table Talk. It comes as its head of development and program, Mina Lefebvre, is getting laid off. So going forward, Facebook is going, or Meta, is going to focus its original content efforts on the VR world. Oh my God. Why can't you shut one dumb thing down and like focus on something good? Like location targeting options for advertisers. <laughs> and finally, last in social, LinkedIn, has a new AI feature. It's been experimenting with a feature that will generate a brief cover letter-like message that candidates can send to hiring managers in the platform. So when you go to apply for a job, you'll see the option to select let AI draft a message to the hiring team alongside all the open roles on the jobs page. So this feature draws on information from your profile, the hiring manager's profile, job description, and the company of interest to create a highly personalized I message. I feel like that's going to make AI or leads from LinkedIn for jobs like less credible. Well, that was already a problem with the instant apply is that you would get crappy leads coming in. So I, I like this with one caveat. All right. This is – I'm poking a hole in it. <clears throat> I want to know – put this out there. I want to know if the person chose to use the AI or not. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's instantly you're out of here. If you're just hitting make AI do this, you, no thank you. You can't put together a paragraph. What about work smarter, not harder? I get that, but at least, I don't, just having the option in the platform just makes it too easy for it's people. Like, I don't easy. consider, yeah. at least go to ChatGPT and figure it out for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Have chat GPT and you copy paste it in. Like you're not working smart, smarter. LinkedIn is working smarter. You know what right. I mean? I would love to see like if it was AI generated and you could be like, out of here. Well, I don't know. I think I think it's it would be nice to know if somebody used it, but I also think it would make a candidate look good if they used it and then maybe modified it because that's what you're doing in the real job. Mm -hmm. Like, right? That's, yeah, that's research and like, what's well, a good example? You. you you pull on other sources mm -hmm. for sure, but if the, you just hit this button and go, I would like to know that this came mm -hmm. like that, and then you're out. The world is just so different. <laughs> it's, I, it's surprising how much you can learn from a cover letter. When I applied for this job, we tell this story all the time, but I wrote an article, and I remember you asking me if I wrote it, and I was like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that wouldn't be like someone else writing it for me. It would be LinkedIn writing it for me. Finding people that can yeah. write is hard. It, that's crazy. It's like nobody does that anymore. Now it's time for this week's WTH. Misguided. I hated all of that. I'm like, who does that? <laughs> Just get rid of that. <laughs> Where we rant, rave, and roll our eyes about a trending digital marketing topic. What are we coming to? <laughs> Honestly, see what had us asking. WTH. This week. All right. In... This is fine news, cue the burning dog. The AI godfather, Jeffrey Hinton, warns of dangers as he quits Google. Dr. Hinton also accepted that his age plays into his decision, so just take that with a grain of salt. But basically, some of his statements were pretty creepy. He said, right now what we're seeing is things like GPT-4 eclipses a person in the amount of general knowledge it has, and it eclipses them by a long way. In terms of reasoning, it is not as good. 
but it does already do simple reasoning. And at the given rate of progress, we expect things to get better quite fast. And then goes on to say he's concerned about bad actors who could try to use AI for bad things. And says, this is just kind of a worst case scenario, kind of a nightmare scenario. You can imagine, for example, some bad actor, and there's in quotes like, Russian President Vladimir Putin decided to give robots the ability to create their own sub goals. Like, I need to get more power. And he says, I've come to the conclusion that the kind of intelligence we're developing is very different from the intelligence we have. We're biological systems, and these are digital systems. And the big difference is that with digital systems, you have many copies of the same set of weights, the same model of the world. And all these copies can learn separately but share their knowledge instantly. So it's as if, as if you had 10,000 people and whenever one person learned something, everybody automatically knew it. And that's how these chatbots can know so much more than any one person. That's I quit. That's scary. I added that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to our real life segment straight out of our accounts and into your ear holes. It's time for Working Hard or Hardly Working, where we talk about what's going on in our IRL work, good, bad, or otherwise. For me this week, I have been trying to set things up for when I'm out on maternity leave. I was reminded how much I love Gmail's vacation responder. I love that you can have a different one for people in your organization and outside. I already have it set up in there and I can just flip the date on when I'm ready to go. And I like that I can plan ahead. Um, and I hate that Slack has nothing for you. Like, why? Good point. But we have huddles. Yeah, you got huddles. What are your thoughts on huddles? Everyone hates them. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, what do you have? All right, so this week for me, working hard is just in general, the marketing team Monday meetings. So they've kind of recently changed where we don't go over necessarily workload, but we can share what we've learned. And Greg has a lovely section in it called Greg's News Corner. And I feel like <laughs> it's just very helpful to get together with the whole marketing team and catch up on news that you might have missed. We're also doing a better job talking about like wins and losses from the week and it's nice to keep everyone up to date and mm -hmm. remind people of good things. So I love them too. Something I don't love is Google ads column sorting by bid type. Oh there, yeah. There are multiple bid types and target return on ad spend bidding is much different than maximize conversion value. And with the way things are set up, they made an asinine change to make target return on ad spend, now maximize conversion value with target return on ad spend. And you can't sort the differences and filter. Like I wanted to see how maximized conversion value was performing against target return on ad spend. And because they're technically the same bid type, maximize conversion value, you can't sort and filter the things out. And then there's bid strategy, but then there's bid strategy type, and I don't know the difference. And why can't we change a target CPA from reports? That would be so nice. I've got one old column I can in one account. I'll try to get it to yours. Okay. Maybe that'll be working hard next week. Okay. <laughs> and now for this week's Cool Tool. As a reminder, our Cool Tool segment is not an official endorsement or paid mention. We're simply sharing something we found in our travels that may be of use to our listeners. And is really, really cool. All right. This week's Cool Tool comes from Samuel, Samuel Schmidt at Samuel Schmidt on Twitter. It's called Through with Three U's, which can help you extract text from any website. All you have to do is enter the URL of the website and click Get Body Text. It'll turn the main body text without any HTML or text from the header or footer. Great for AI usage, if you want to throw in a chat GPT or something like that. Change Former marketing and talk guest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As always, we'll have the link in our newsletter, marketingoclock.com forward slash newsletter, as well as on our Discord, community.marketingoclock.com. So pick your poison and check it out. Now it's time for our must-read marketing article of the week, an article so advanced, so in-depth, so detailed, that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on today's show. This week's must-read marketing article of the week comes from Laura Sheely over on Search Engine Land, and it's called Four B2B Paid Media Strategies to Stay Ahead of the Curve. Uh, I'll give you a few here. You're going to have to read the article for all of them. But one I liked is Test New Channels and New Features, uh, bringing in other 
items and I guess platforms that you might not think about with B2B, but giving it a test with some specific examples like Instagram and search results ads or TikTok search result ads, things like that. Also, she talks about uh, using the gift of customer feedback and how you can use that to help your B2B uh, campaigns and get success. And she's going to be on a panel with me at SMX Advanced June 13th and 14th. It is free to sign up. Head over to Search Engine Land. You'll see the links to get over there to SMX Advanced. Thank you, Laura. And now onto our playlist of curated songs to work to. You can head over to playlist.marketingoclock.com to listen to Marketing a Playlist. I just decided I'm adding three songs this week. What? <laughs> I'm going to be out. I like always listen to the same thing and something happened this week where I was like on a musical discovery journey. Okay. So what are the three Taylor Swift <laughs> okay. songs for the week? No, the first one I have to, I finally saw Six the Musical at Chase. It was so good. Spice Girls concert meets Henry VIII. I will be doing the opening song, Ex Wives. It's five minutes and 50 seconds long. Enjoy. My next... <laughs> My next selection is, oh my God, you guys, Kelly Clarkson's new song, Me, will break your heart. Listen to it knowing that it's about the same guy piece by piece is about. She is just our queen. She doesn't get enough respect. Third, Rianne from work turned me on to this lady, Jessie Ware, who I should have known about a long time ago. She's like new. She just released this album, but it's straight disco. It's so good. I like the song Pearl, so I'm adding that too. Wow. Nicole, you're welcome, everybody. I only have one song, uh, and it's Do You Like Me by Daniel Caesar. <laughs> Greg? All right, I've got a classic here. This is a great feel-good song. Rich Girl by Hall & Oates. Oh, that's a good song. So good. Classic. All right, that does it for today's show. It is now officially not marketing o'clock. Thanks for listening. Miss you already. And we can't wait to see you next week. Thanks for listening to Marketing O'Clock. If you're looking for more information on today's topic, head over to marketingoclock.com slash newsletter to receive every single article we cover. We share the news as it breaks in our Discord community. Head over to community.marketingoclock.com to join. Welcome to this week's Shoot in the Hack. We're after our famous Friday news show. We don't talk about marketing anymore. We just... Shoot the hack. Greg has a game today. I know no details. Well, it's about you. The game that's, is about you. I'm getting that vibe and therefore... I'm terrified. As you know, this might be Shop's last show. So I wanted to do trivia, but I wanted to make it easy on you. I wanted to give you a competitive advantage in the trivia game. Okay. I want to be nice to you. I usually win trivia anyway. <laughs> That's the I don't debatable. know where you've been. So we have a game of trivia, birthing trivia. Oh, no. <laughs> you should know more than everybody birthing? else. Birthing. Birthing. Okay. Birthing trivia. So ring in with your name, and if it's a number, it's going to be closest to... To who wins? You've witnessed two births, technically. I've witnessed one to this point, so I don't know. Okay. Oh, but you're not playing. Okay, I'm got not it. Playing. I'm totally going to win. Okay. Mm. The quickest labor ever, <clears throat> or surely pretty close to it, was how long? Are we doing like... Everybody go. Or... Closest, yeah. Tables. Oh. Tables. 30 seconds. Shep, five minutes. Nicole, three minutes. Wow. Game theory is strong again. Um, I'm going to give that to you, Nicole. It was two minutes. Nicole is off by one minute. So Nicole is on the two board minutes. one minute. Do you have any details about that? Yes, it was Australian mom Mary Gorgian, who has been dubbed the queen of fast laborers, got up to use a bathroom, and she suddenly <gasps> felt her son's head crowning. Two minutes later, he was born. Wow. Okay. All right. What was the longest oh, labor? Oh, no. Shep. Shep. 103 hours. Okay. Nicole, 92. Hours, okay. I'm going to go with 72 hours. Who was the highest? You? Me. You win. This was oh, 75 no. days. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Oh, it was oh also gosh. a trip, like triplets. I don't know. They started to give labor and then- Then they stopped FedEx. it probably, so yeah. whatever. So Both of those stories. And the other lady probably just didn't know she was in labor. Yeah. Okay, so Nicole won, Shep won. Okay. What is the average time of labor? Tables. Tables. Eight hours. New, and this is for new mothers. Eight hours, okay? Oh. Um, 
for new mothers. I'm just going to say nine. Okay. You said eight and then nine. Okay. I'm going to go with 12. <laughs> okay. T uh, tables wins. It was six and a half hours. They weren't induced. <laughs> okay. When was the first C-section observed? Shep. Shep. Wasn't it Caesar? In the year, not a name. Closest <laughs> I have to the year. No went. idea. Okay, this when is funny. Caesar. <laughs> he was like around with like Cleopatra, right? Okay. So we're talking like BC, right? I just need a year. A year. I really don't know. One hundred BC. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Right. One hundred BC. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nicole. Um, Before the big fellow was born. <laughs> I'm gonna do like 1270 BC. I have no clue. Okay, so we have 100 BC and 1270 BC, which is actually further back. Okay, tables. Are you kidding? Right. I just googled it. Okay. 1600. Tables wins. I've got it in 1500. My Google says wait. Oh, oh so I it must have not off. been Caesar. Caesar was born in 100 BC, though. The first written record of a successful C-section where the mom and baby both survives all the way back in 1500. Oh. Okay. You know what goes the other direction when we're talking BC, right? That's why I said she's Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I know my, my, my Making math. sure you don't think I'm some big dummy. Math, no, I didn't. It goes I, up to zero and yeah. then it starts again. And then eight, zero. yeah. Okay, managing pain during childbirth was largely taboo until Queen Victoria had her eighth child uh, Leopold, in 1853, pain relief was normalized so fast that, in fact, towards the end of the 19th centuries, American doctors started giving women what substance to help with childbirth? Towards the end of what century? 19th century. What substance I'm gonna was provided? Say First one gets it. It's like cocaine. Alcohol. Alcohol, cocaine. Oh, I was going to do alcohol. Absent. That's still alcohol. Okay, anybody else want another guess here? Zins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big Zin. They're huge in the 1800s. A heroin was the correct answer. Oh, oh, you were close I then. Close. Heroin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what was the name of the cake that women in labor were expected to make for the people providing them help in the Middle Ages called? What? It's the name of a cake. It's a hint. It, it sounds like a sound that you make when you are told to make a cake when you're in labor. Oh, no. A scream cake? Close. <laughs> so. A groaning cake. A groaning cake. Okay. They're to be given to the women's guests, but they're also thought to help speed along the birthing process. Maybe think about that. Are you keeping track of the scores? Yes. Tables has two and is winning the birthing competition, and you both have one. Okay. What percentage of babies are born on their due date? 31. Okay. Closest Tables. wins. Tables? 17. Nicole? Um, 22. Tables wins. 5%. Only 5% are wow. born on their due date. Okay. Do you even want more? I don't know if you're going to be able to catch tables on this. He's over there Googling it. <laughs> okay. Not true. Here's one. All, just ring in with your name. We All don't know about, a lot about Tables' life before joining the show. He could have been a doula, okay? <laughs> I just skipped a question on doulas here. All mammals except humans routinely eat what after giving birth? Oh, oh Nicole. No. Nicole. The placenta. Okay, Nicole's two. They Chef's do? One. Yes. I thought hippies made that up. Okay, <laughs> what are you supposed to do, a mother and a baby, as soon as possible after birth to help Chef. keep a baby at the oh. ideal temperature as well as reg regulating the mother's and baby's hormones? Skin-to-skin -skin contact. Yes. Okay. So, the winner of the birthing trivia, Tables with three, Shep with two, yeah. and Nicole with two. I've got another little fun fact here. For okay. you. This will make you feel better. <laughs> I'm scared. Okay? No, this is, this is, this is a here to make you feel better. Okay. Uh, a woman in India gave birth to her baby while using the toilet on a train that emptied directly onto the tracks. She passed out after giving birth, and she reported what happened when rail workers found the baby alive and unharmed. Oh. So if she can do that, you should be smooth sailing. Oh, I was so worried. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that baby's the real winner, not table. So <laughs> we'll see you next week. Maybe not me.